The poet that we're working with here is Tennyson, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, he is apparently the second most frequently quoted writer according to the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations behind Shakespeare. And you can see I have two of his more famous quotes here. Um, and I think you'll recognize at least one of them, if not both of them. He was one of the most popular poets of the Victorian era. He succeeded Wordsworth as the Poet Laureate, which was a position that he held for 42 years. Now, uh, in a little bit in his personal life, he was one of 12 children. He was tutored by his father in the classics and in modern languages, uh, but his home was not peaceful. His father was an alcoholic who suffered frequent breakdowns. Uh, one brother got into a physical altercation with his father. Another brother was later confined to a mental hospital. A third brother became an opium addict. Tennyson himself was educated at Cambridge University. Uh, the first poem that we're working with is The Lady of Shalott. He published that in the early 1830s um, and critics initially called this poem, the collection that it was in, affected and obscure, uh, really, really very critical of it. But it was republished in 1842, this time to favorable reviews. Now, I debated not reading The Lady of Shalott. It's kind of long, but um, I think that there are a lot of parallels that you can draw between The Lady of Shalott and our current situation. So this is one of many. The Lady of Shalott is one of many, and notice that this is Shalott, not Shallot. Shallot is a small onion, has two L's, one T. Shalott, one L, two T's. This is um, one of many poems that Tennyson used Arthurian legend as sort of an inspiration. Uh, and you'll see through the poem, Lancelot shows up, there's mentions of Camelot. So we already have that sort of fantasy setting and really Tennyson creates that kind of dreamlike, almost a fairy tale like atmosphere through his descriptions in the poem. Now on the surface, it is a story. This is a narrative poem, so it tells a story. You've got characters, you've got rising action, a climax, falling action, resolution. So it's a narrative poem that tells a story of a lady who's imprisoned in a tower because of um, an unknown curse. And then it tells us what happens to her when that curse falls on her. But this could be read on a more allegorical level. For example, there could be the relationship between art and reality or a comment on what it means to really be living. So there's a lot of different levels that you can interpret this poem. I'm not going to read it in this video. There is a separate link posted to an audio version of me reading the poem in the supplemental resources. There's another version of it being read by a different person who's actually a professional voice actor. You can listen to it via the online textbook. So take a look at the supplemental resources if you need an audio version. What I'm going to do is just talk you through the different parts of it. What you need to do on your worksheet is you need to paraphrase each section. You need to identify contrasting images. Uh, Tennyson incorporates a lot of opposites here, and I think he does that to create this sort of dreamlike fairy tale kind of mood and setting, uh, and really also to emphasize aspects of the lady's life. Uh, you also need to identify sound devices, and I have a page with all the definitions of the sound devices for you. Take a look at those definitions, uh, and then I would suggest listening to a version of this poem. Sound devices are a lot easier to hear than they are to see. Uh, and then finally, there's some kind of um, analysis question that goes with each one of these sections. Okay, so the beginning, part one, is really our rising action and sort of our setup. We learn the setting. So we know that we're near Camelot, we are near a river, and we're near a road that runs along the river. But in the middle of the river, you have an island. And so right there, you have a set of opposites, right? You've got that land versus the water, that isolated island versus, you know, the busy road. Lots of natural descriptions. I think Tennyson, while he's technically a Victorian, he retained a lot of those romantic sort of sentiments, valuing nature, valuing emotions, that sort of thing. So we've got lots of descriptions of nature. And then in the descriptions of nature, I think we see other opposites. So we have this space of flowers, bright, colorful, beautiful flowers, 
but in the middle of that space of flowers are these gray walls. So you've got a number of opposites contained within that set of images, right? You've got natural versus man-made flowers versus wall. You've got colorful flowers versus gray of the walls. Um, and then even if you think like three-dimensionally, you've got the flat ground versus these vertical towers. Then you also have these sounds, right? You've got the breezes, you've got the running water, you've got the quivering trees, the sounds of the wind, but the island itself is silent. And that's where the lady lives. She lives in this tower by herself. Again, you've got horses and barges traveling down that road, but then the stillness that's contained in the tower. But nobody's seen her. Who has seen her wave her hand or who has seen her at the window or is she known? Nobody has seen her, and the only people who have heard her are the reapers, um, people gathering wheat in the mornings. They've only heard her singing. Nobody has seen her, and so she's sort of mysterious, right? Again, the fairy lady, like a like a fairy tale, like a, I don't know, like a, a myth. So they know of her, but nobody knows her. Nobody's seen her. She's stuck there on that island by herself. In part two, we learn more about what the lady's life is. So she weaves. All day, every day, she weaves these scenes in her tapestry. But what's important is where she gets these scenes. She can't look out the window. There is some kind of a curse. She doesn't know what it is, but she just knows that she can't look directly out her window and see what's going on. So what she does is she has a mirror set up and in that mirror she can see what's going by. But what's interesting is Tennyson's use of word, his word choice here. Instead of saying reflection or images, he says shadows. And so if you think about what that implies, you know, shadows, you see the vague outline and the general shape of something, but not the actual Thing. And so I think we have a set of opposites there, right? The real world that is happening outside the lady's window, that road that runs down to Camelot, versus the reflection in the mirror, which is not reality and not true experience. So she's weaving, she's weaving, she's weaving. Um, she watches all of these things that go through her mirror. And you can see, again, we've got lots of colors outside her window, right? We've got curly hair. We've got crimson. We have blue. Uh, we have red cloaks. So lots of colors outside, but shadows in her mirror. We have a funeral. We have a wedding. And the lady says that she is sick of shadows. She is tired of those shadows. And now in the third part, Lancelot appears. And look at how Lancelot is described. We've got all of these images of flame and light and brightness. Uses all of these Z sounds, right? Almost like zing, like almost automatopoeia for how he appears even in the shadows of her mirror. He's sparkling. The bridle on his horse is full of gems. He's like the stars, the galaxy. Um, he's blazing. So all of these images of light and bright contra contra uh, contrasted with the shadows that the lady lives in. And so when he comes into her mirror, she leaves the web, she leaves the loom, she looks out the window. The brightness of Lancelot forces her to look out that window, something she knows she can't do. And when she does that, the mirror cracks and she knows that that curse is upon her. So at that point, the lady has to decide. Is she going to, even now that the curse has fallen, now that her actions have brought this curse upon her, is she going to live in her in her four gray walls or is she going to leave and experience life and that's what she does she leaves the tower 
to experience life. And now instead of the peaceful flowers, we have a storm that's brewing. It's raining over towered Camelot. And again, we have that sort of natural um, set of images, right? Camelot's full of towers, man-made. The Isle of Shalott, it's that island in a river. So we've got those sets of opposites again, but then we also have the, na the, the weather where it had been this beautiful blazing sun. Now we have a stormy east wind. So she looks down to Camelot. It's the closing of the day. The sun is setting, and I think that's probably metaphorical there. Um, and what she does is she goes down the tower. She finds a boat, and she writes her name, the Lady of Shalott, along the prow of the boat. She gets in that boat, and she decides to float down to Camelot. Now, they heard her singing, and these lines, heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were darkened wholly, turned to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. So I think, again, we have another set of opposites here, right? So she is slowing down, right? Slowly stopping any movement while her boat though is continuing to sail down the river so we've got movement versus stillness and then of course life versus death because in camelot what were they doing they were having a big party uh, you can see that it says there was sounds of royal cheer they were having a party and now but as she floats down the river those sounds stop so again we've got these sounds versus cheerfulness versus mournfulness. Again, another set of opposites. Everybody comes out to see her and everybody crosses themselves out of fear, makes a sign across, out of fear when they see her, except for Lancelot. Lancelot says that she is beautiful. She should receive grace. And so that's where we have sort of the conclusion, the resolution here of this poem. So like I said, on the surface, you can read this as if it is just sort of a, a version of a legend or a fairy tale, um, just a story about a woman who has a curse befall her. But I think you could read this a little bit more allegorically and really think about what comment Tennyson is making here about, about life. When, when did the lady really start to live? Um, and was that worth it? Was that action worth it? Is it better to not experience anything or is it better to have actual authentic experiences and that's i think where this poem leaves you you have to decide which which part of the lady's life was the better part to that lady of shallot <laughs>